ever feel like you've forgotten something? Something slips your mind or something's out of place, something just doesn't seem to be right. And it gets to bothering you. I think I've told you before about times when we would start off on a trip to Ohio and get maybe 30 miles away from home and my wife said, I think I forgot to turn off the iron <laughs> or something of that nature and have to turn around and go back. She's not the only one that does that. There are lots of times, you know, I think I did this or I think I did that. And one time I, I uh, was at a church building and uh, doing some stuff and I noticed that the baptistry was, was kind of down and I turned the water on. I said, well, I'll turn that off before I leave. And the next morning, I woke up and said, I left the water running on in the baptistry. But it weighed on my mind all night, kind of. It was subconscious. I guess it was there. And I run back out here and checked, and the drain had taken care of everything. So there was another time that that happened that it wasn't such a good outcome. I flooded a church building and raided over the home one time. But those things do happen. We do forget things now and then. And thankfully, God has given us a mind and a subconscious that at times we, we, we just know. We just know something's wrong. We know something is out of place. We know something is out of sorts, and we just can't put our finger on it. Either that, we can't put our finger on it, or it's, you know, I know what the problem is, but if I can just get around that problem without having to face that problem and do what I need to do, then it'll be all right. And, and sometimes in life, there are just problems we can't get around. We have to go smack because they're always going to be there. They're always going to be on our subconscious. They're going to be on our mind. They're going to be hurting us spiritually, emotionally. And that's going to cause bodily harm, too, if it goes for very long. But I, set that, I, I present that to you to set up the lesson because that's exactly what's happening with this rich, young ruler. You've got to take all three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, to find out that he was a rich, young ruler. <laughs> and one, he's young, and another, he's rich. Well, probably think he gets rich in all of them, but, but a ruler. And, and, and you combine them, and then you, you see the complete picture of the man. Now, some scholars say, well, he was, that means he was a ruler of the synagogue. We've been talking about, or we're going to talk about Jairus next week. Yeah, probably in our morning Bible class. Jairus was a leader of the synagogue. It doesn't say that this man was the leader of the synagogue. It's highly uh, unlikely that he was, though some scholars say that he was, because even though he knows and understands a lot of things about religion and about the law of Moses, he doesn't seem to be one who has those things in the forefront of his mind. His concerns more, it seems, toward the country. He may have been one of the Herodians, a lesser prince. He may have been one who uh, had been given a city or something to watch over, to take care of. We just don't have a lot, a lot of information about this man. But the information that we do have about it is that he knows something's wrong. He knows something's wrong in his spiritual life. He knows something's wrong because he's not making the connection that he should be making with God. So at least he sets out to find out what's, what's wrong here. What, what's going on in my life? But because of who he is, because of what he has looked at, because of the way he views the world, he comes to Jesus with the right attitude, good master. But then he falls back to that religion that, that he really, truly believed. And he says, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? 
as if there's one thing that any of us could do to inherit eternal life. And there simply isn't. We know that there are religions that teach that, hey, you do these seven things and you're guaranteed a home in heaven for eternity. Doesn't matter what else you do. It doesn't matter if you're the world's worst sinner. That's all right. We'll put our stamp of approval on you and ship you right through into heaven when this life is over. But Jesus doesn't talk that way. That's man's ideas creeping in that somehow we can do enough in this life to earn heaven. Absent a relationship with God. And that's what this man's problem was. He didn't have a relationship with God. He was counting upon his riches. He was counting upon his works to get him into heaven. What good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus starts off with the simple things, doesn't he? <coughs> You're under covenant relationship with God. I'm sure you've heard about the covenant. You know, this little thing we call the law of Moses. And, and Jesus says, keep the commandments. And, and he kind of asks, oh, which ones? Jesus says there in verses 18 and 19, You shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? See, there are some people in this world that, well, if I just do the Ten Commandments, everything's going to be all right. But they forget that there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I could memorize 613 commandments. I just don't think I could do it. I have a hard time memorizing Scripture. It takes me a while to, to really get them. And, and there's some people that could do that. And, and they could probably just rattle it right off, all those 613. But yet, there comes this stage of life that says, wait a minute, maybe there's one more. This concept that we have in our mind that says, maybe, maybe 613 aren't enough. The priest, the priest of hey, you keep the law of Moses. You do these 613 commandments and you're going to go to heaven. The Pharisees, you know, they stepped up a little bit more and said, hey, you do those 613 commandments, plus you come over here and you learn some of our traditions. And if you do some of our traditions and those things, you'll go to heaven. Now just a little side note as we look at that. Jesus said there wasn't any of them going to heaven. God said there wasn't any of them going to heaven whether they kept the law or not. Whether they kept the tradition of the Pharisees or not. There wasn't a one of them that was going to heaven unless he died upon the cross and shed his blood. And that they were born again. That they were converted change to become the children of God. And then, then they could inherit eternal life. Not earn. Inherit. And they would inherit it on the good graces of God coming into their life and providing mercy for them. And on the good graces of their gracefully walking through this life. Trust him, serving the God of heaven. So this young man said, it's conceivable that he could have kept the commandments that Jesus had talked about here. It's inconceivable that he could have kept all of them, which would make him a sinner, and he would need a Savior. Jesus is leading up to that. But there are some things that take place before this happens. The young man, listen to this, wanted one more thing to do. 
And sometimes in life, that's how we get. I've done everything, and I'm really good, so just one more thing. What one more thing do I need to do? And, and, and in times past, people have, just like the Pharisees, they, and in Christianity, people have said, well, you, you need God, and then you need this creed. Here's this creed, and this creed will tell you how to be a good whatever. Man-made religion. Stick it in there. Uh, this creed will teach me how to be that. Well, the Bible will teach me how to be a Christian. God's Word will teach me how to be a Christian. Yeah, but, but that's not enough. You need this little extra. Or, and, 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 and every creed that a man would make or develop, they're either going to add something to the Word of God or they're going to leave something out. So what did this young man want to do? when he comes to Jesus and says, what one thing do I do? What, what, what more do I need to do to, to have eternal life? Let's see what it says. Shall I do that I may have eternal life? Jesus adds something. He said, no, I'm not going to add something. I'm not going to add anything. He doesn't conceive of Jesus taking something away. That's the whole point of it, isn't it? Yeah. Unless Jesus takes something away, none of us can inherit eternal life. All these things that I've done for my youth, but still, still, he knows there's something wrong. He knows that it's not right what's going on. He knows he doesn't have what, what he should have. It's not within him. There's something gone from him. What do I still lack, he asks. That's a dangerous question, isn't it? <laughs> That's a dangerous question. It's dangerous because... Who do you ask that question of? If you ask that question of me, I might, I might say something. And I could be totally wrong. And you know why? Because I don't know your heart, really, truly. I don't know what's going on in there. I don't know what's in, in, in your spirit. You go to any other man on the face of the earth and ask him, what do I still lack? He might be able to help you. He might be able to guide you through the Scripture, but he can't tell you. And, and just like this young man, sometimes we can't even tell ourselves what we lack. We can't put our finger on it. But give him credit, he's looking. But he's not looking in the right way. He's not looking with the right attitude. Because when he comes to Jesus, yes, he bows down before Jesus. But there's no way this young man's looking for repentance. Is there? So what's he looking for? Justification. I've done all of these things since my youth. Wow, that's pretty good. You got a home in heaven. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said he's still in holy. But he didn't need Jesus to tell him that, did he? Because he knew it in his heart he was still incomplete. What do I still like? This young man had doubts about his salvation. He didn't come for repentance. He came for justification. And he didn't receive it. But doesn't that sound like the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14? Remember that little parable that Jesus told that, that two men went down to the temple to pray. One man was a Pharisee. The other was a publican, whom the Pharisee looked down upon as a sinner. Many publicans 
were sinners, but there were some who weren't. But the Pharisee lifted his hands to heaven. Lord, I'm thankful I'm not like this publican. Look at what I go back to this young man. Look at what I do. I pay my tithes. I do my fasting. I do this. I do this. I do this. I do this. I'm glad I'm not like him. Now there was a man who didn't think there was something lacking in himself. He thought there was something lacking in the public. The publican, a man who knew and understood that he was a sinner in need of a Savior. A one who, because of his humbleness, not even lift his eyes to heaven, but smote himself on the breast and begged God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Jesus said that publican was justified. But the Pharisee wasn't. Jesus says this rich young ruler, yeah, he comes and he wants something more to do. Look, I'm so good, but I think there's something more I have to do. Give me something more to do. And he's still empty. All of these things that he did, there was still an emptiness within him. That those things couldn't fill up. We, we talk about the Kodia. In, in, in a religious sense, a spiritual sense, that there's something here, some place inside of us. It's an empty place. Kind of like the colon in the intestines. And we put stuff in there and it just goes on through. It doesn't stick around. It's a nourishment out of it. It, it. it goes through and it's gone and then it's empty again. It says, fill me up, fill me up, fill me up. It's gone. Fill me up, fill me up. And spiritually, it's like that within us, that there's a place within us that only God can occupy. A place within us that only God can fill. And, and like this young man, he knew it was empty. And he knew there was something wrong. He knew it was incomplete. Instead of seeking God, give me something else to do. Jesus could have given him the 614th commandment. And he'd feel no better when he did it. Because God wasn't there. All of these things I have kept from my youth. Uh, the hardest person to convert to Christ is not the vile sin hardest person to convert to Christ is the person who thinks he has no sin. It did not matter what he would do until he repented. He was lost. He was empty. And there was no joy in his life. All these things I have kept from my youth up. What do I still lack? He knew it, didn't he? He knew it. I'm, I'm doing these things. I'm doing these things. I'm doing these things. There's something missing. There's something not there. The young man's not asking what qualities of moral character he lacked. He was just looking for something else to do. Looking for a sacrament, we might say. Jesus' instructions to him, though, are in two parts, if you notice that, right? Did you ever break that down and look at it? Two parts. Number one, Jesus said unto him, if you want to be perfect. Now, we, we look at that word perfect and we say, yeah, only God is perfect, only Jesus is perfect, and that's true. But many times that word means complete or whole. He knows he's not complete. He knows he's not whole. He knows there's an emptiness in there. He's lacking something. He just simply doesn't know what it is. He can't put his finger on it because he's thinking in material terms and not spiritual terms. 
So Jesus instructs him, two parts. Number one, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor. Hey, commandment number 614. You wanted it. You asked for it. Here it is. Go and sell what you have. Give the money to the poor. Jesus looked into his heart. Jesus looked in and saw the one thing that was keeping this man, this rich young ruler, from God. And from having a spiritual completeness. And the young man says, I can't do that. I can't do it. He loved his riches more than he loved his God. Of God. Can't even call him his God. But you see the point that's going on here. Now listen, don't go away with, with the attitude. Well, friends said that we've got to give away uh, all, uh, sell all of our goods and give the money to the poor. Now, now this was a instruction to this young man based upon this young man's question. Because you may not have a problem with money. I don't have a problem with money. I don't have any. So I don't have a problem with it. I got other problems. Money might be one of them. If there's anything that's keeping me from God, that's the problem I need to work on. That's the problem I need to And you can't look into my heart and say that's the problem. I've got to want to be the one who does the self-examination and see what it is. And that's simply a spiritual maturity, a spiritual growth that we have to work through. We can't get around the problem. We've got to work through it. This young man did not want to work through the problem. He just wanted a way around it. Give me something. A lot of people in this world, they'll, they'll try to fill up that empty place with alcohol and, and drugs and illicit sexual activities and gambling. And you name it. The, the world's got so much just filled up, filled up, but like everything else, it just, it doesn't fill it up. It might anesthetize, anesthetize, say it correctly, our spirit for a fleeting moment. And then it's gone. And we feel emptier than we did in the first place. That, that's what addiction does, isn't it? Addiction. Yeah, you, you, you take one drink, you take one shot, you take one whatever, and then the next time it takes more. It takes more to get the same result. And the next time even more to get the same result, more to get the same result. And it's just a downward spiral because it's the wrong thing that people need. What people need is God. What people need is Jesus. Not something more to do. Not something else to do. Those things will come along, won't they? The things that God wants us to do, they will come along if we, if we are seeking God. I need to get back to my lesson. Second point. It is the lesson, isn't it? Come follow me is what Jesus said. Come follow me. We've got to follow Jesus. Until we follow Jesus, we'll, we'll never be complete. We'll never be whole, perfect, spiritually complete, mature, whole. Never going to happen. Jesus knew this man's wealth would prevent him from doing that. So he said, that's what you have to get rid of. You have to do it. Well, what did this man really lack? Four things here. And, and, and think about this. Think about this in the context of your own life. Where you are right now. If you 
feel spiritually healthy and full and complete, that's fine. But if not, consider like this young man should have done. What, what did this man really lack? Number one, he lacked a sense of reality. What do you mean re reality? We deal with morality or reality out here in the world. You, you Christians, you're the ones that are doing unreal things. No, we walk by faith, not by sight. But sight, see, in a fallen world, that's not necessarily the reality of, of, of what we have to deal with. He lacked a sense of reality in this sense. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This young man didn't have truth in him. He was deceiving himself. He lacked wholehearted service. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The heart is far away. Oh, they'd say, Lord, Lord. They didn't do what they'd say to do. Why not? John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. They'll come along if you love me. If you don't love me, that's where it gets out of life. He liked putting God first, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Because they won't matter so much. These physical, material things, they'll be put in their proper place. You won't need so much of them. Isn't that amazing thing? When we get things in their proper alignment, when we put God first in material things, they, they lose their charm. The song that we sang about streets of gold in heaven, something of that nature. Imagine that. Going to a place where people don't fight over gold. <laughs> you want it? There it is. Go get it. It's just laying on the street. It's worthless. We think that's worth more than our soul. He didn't see God's righteousness. He saw his own righteousness. And in the process, he found neither. Because he didn't find God. And he still went away empty. He lacked self-denial. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Luke adds, take up his cross daily. This isn't a one day a week thing. Daily. <coughs> this young man went away sorrowful. He didn't have to. He didn't. Because Jesus was right there. And, and, and Jesus was there, and he had compassion on him. And if this young man would have responded in the right and proper way, with a right heart, he would have gone with Jesus. From that point on in his life. But he refused. And he went away sorrowful. We don't want to go away from here sorrowful, do we? You don't want You don't have to. You can go here like the Ethiopian eunuch rejoicing because God is now filling you up. He's taken your sins <coughs> away. He's forgiven you by the blood of His Son, Jesus. And He's given you hope what do I lack is the question we need to be asking ourselves. Acts 2.38 Men on the day of Pentecost. Men and brethren, what must we do? Repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've done that in the past, but 
feel that emptiness that is there, then you don't need to relinquish something. Relinquish some sin. Repent. Seek the prayers of the congregation. Bring you back into a right relationship with God. Don't leave here sorrowful when you don't have to. Blessed be yours. Have me. Please come. Take a seat here in the front. Stand and sing the invitation song.